My name is Lemmy Rockaway, and I'm a sophomore in the college studying cognitive science. This past summer, I performed a pilot study to discover the correlations between training method and canine behavior. Um, so first off is just an outline, kind of where we're going. I'll start with why I'm studying this, followed by what I actually did, the data I collected, and what results I found, um, then the limitations, and what we'll be doing in the future. So first is the controversy. Um, there's a common saying in the dog training world that um, the only thing two dog trainers can agree on is what the third one is doing wrong. And it's unfortunately pretty accurate from my experience. Dog trainers disagree on pretty much everything there is to disagree on. Um, but the primary disagreement is over the use of positive punishment. And so that's what I wanted to look at. Um, just as a review, you probably learned this in a psych class, but there's kind of four quadrants of like the operant conditioning. And, um, but my study primarily dealt with positive reinforcement and positive punishment. Um, the other two I didn't really deal with because those aren't the main controversies. Um, but an example of positive reinforcement is giving the dog something that they like in return for a behavior that you like. So if the dog sits, you give them a treat. That encourages this behavior. You want to see it more frequently. Positive punishment is kind of the opposite. Um, so you give the dog something that it doesn't like in response to a behavior that you don't like. So if the dog is barking, you can say no, and that's a punishment. Um, you're adding something to decrease a behavior. Um, positive punishment can really range in um, intensity. It can be as mild as saying no, or it can be very intense, like more intense than necessary. You can hold the dog's muzzle. You could you know, do all sorts of different things to try and decrease this behavior. So my study dealt with primarily positive reinforcement and positive punishment. Um, just for reference, when I'm referring to them, I'll probably refer to them as positive reinforcement and positive punishment groups um, individually, but the positive punishment group had a lot of positive reinforcement. They were not at all only trained with positive punishment. Um, they had almost as much positive reinforcement. It just included a little bit of positive punishment for certain behaviors. So an overview of what I did. Um, there were two groups that I worked with. So I had eight total puppies, and four puppies were assigned to each group of training method. Um, one training was one where I never gave them any positive punishment whatsoever intentionally, and the other group did have certain positive punishment um, depending on what behaviors they showed. Um, the puppies were from two different litters that had the same sire, and they were born three days apart. So I wanted the dogs to be as genetically similar as possible just because I didn't want to introduce any other variables. Um, logistically, there wasn't a litter born at the time that had eight puppies because that's a pretty large litter. Um, so I had to take from two different litters, but they did have the same sire, so that was pretty close. Um, each puppy was randomly assigned to a training group, so I hadn't met them before. I literally sat at my desk and flipped a coin. Um, but the genders were matched between groups. So there was one male and three females for each group. Um, this was just because that's how many males and females there were in the litters. Um, and then also there were two puppies from each litter in each group. Again, trying to just distribute it, make sure there were no um, variables that um, I didn't account for, make sure that one litter wasn't entirely in one training group. The study lasted eight weeks, and the reasoning for this is because puppies develop, they learn more over time, and I needed this to be as um, long-term as possible so I could see if there were any longer-term effects. Um, longer than eight weeks would have been better, but my summer was only so long, and I had to collect the data afterwards. Um, so it was eight weeks long, just to make sure that I got as much information as possible. So th the study took place in Lexington, Kentucky, where I'm from and where the breeder is located. Um, the breeder was fantastic and gave me a barn um, to work with completely. I could do whatever I wanted with it to set it up correctly. Um, so there were stalls in the middle of the barn that the puppies could be in. Um, they would be in kennels in those stalls during the day when they weren't training or playing um, and at night when I had to leave them. Then there was a training room attached to this, and I set this up to be like a home environment. Um, you can see it's in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, so I put a couch in there. I put um, just, there was a fireplace that I um, kept on sometimes. I had a radio. I had plants and carpets. The purpose of this is I wanted to replicate real-world dog training. It's, um, real dog training is not a lab environment. I didn't want it to be this clean environment. I want it to be more like a home because that's where real dogs are trained. Um, so I was just trying to replicate that, and um, then there was also a yard outside for them to play on um, in their free time. So these are the eight puppies that I used. The top row are the puppies that um, were trained with positive reinforcement and positive punishment, and the bottom row just experienced positive reinforcement. 
Um, so again, the left puppies, um, the far left, those are both males. Um, the, all the others are females. And then there were two puppies from each litter in each group. Each puppy was assigned a color. And this was purely so that I could keep them straight. Um, I, puppies all look the same when you first look at them. <laughs> um, and I just needed to make sure that logistically I knew who needed what um, training. And um, so all their collars were that color, their um, kennels were that color, their documents all had this color on it, um, just so that I didn't get them mixed up. <laughs> this is their daily schedule. So I would go in at 8 a.m. and let them all outside, feed them breakfast, let them play for half an hour because they've been pent up all night and puppies have a lot of extra energy. Um, <laughs> so then after that, I alternated between training puppies and each training block was 25 minutes long. The actual training sessions were only 10 minutes. Um, the other 15 minutes were for actually letting the dog outside to relieve itself and um, recording all the data after the training session and then putting it back into its kennel and feeding it. Um, in between each training block, I had five minutes to take out a different training puppy. You can see it's those small blocks um, in between the larger ones. This is just logistically puppies have small bladders. I needed to take them out frequently. Um, there was nothing scientific about this. I just, the puppies need to go to the bathroom. Um, <laughs> and so there were two training sessions per day. In between, they got lunch. Um, and after a training session, the puppy was either put back into a kennel or into an exercise pen, which is, um, it's a wire four foot by four foot pen, and it had a socialization item in there. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but whichever um, scenario the dog was going back to, the dog received both of those situations throughout the entire day, so it was equal among all the puppies. Um, that's not something I was testing. There was no difference between training groups there. So these are the socialization items that I referred to. Um, I had the puppies from ages 10 weeks to 18 weeks, and um, during that time period, there's a lot of developmental stages that they go through. Um, there's a lot of critical periods where they need to be exposed to new and scary objects in order to learn how to adapt to that and overcome those fears. Um, because these dogs had the same schedule every day, if I hadn't had introduced um, new items, then they wouldn't have developed properly and they would have been kind of terrified adults. Um, so I had to make sure that I was creating well-balanced adult dogs um, because these dogs were all being placed in homes after the training. So these are some examples of the socialization items. A lot of times dogs are scare scared of umbrellas. So I put an open umbrella in there. They could learn that umbrellas are fine. They're not scary. They provide shade. They can chew them. They destroyed this one. Um, there was a tub of water, sand. Um, in this picture, you can see there's um, a couple circles. They're discs, and they're called wobble boards. And it's kind of like a teeter-totter. When you step on it, it moves. Um, and at first, that's really scary for a puppy. But by the end, they realized that they, these were actually kind of fun. Um, and then I also had not pictured uh, metal grates, like you see on the sidewalk, that dogs are often scared of, the open grates. Um, just things to make sure that I was creating well-balanced, well-trained dogs to be placed in homes later. Also, every week, um, the puppies all went on, I called it a field trip. And um, so every Friday, we would go to a new, like a pet-friendly store that the dogs had obviously never been exposed to. And there was a lot of stimulation in these places. So we went to pet stores, um, like farm supply stores, home improvement stores, just places where there's a lot of stimulation and they're most likely going to be a little bit nervous. Um, in those places, I took each puppy for 15 to 20 minutes and I worked on obedience commands with them. I uh, helped them overcome fears of like a lawnmower or a weed eater, um, just things that they encountered they were scared of. Because of this, the, all these critical periods that the dogs were going through, I needed to make sure that I was exposing them to enough new experiences. Um, and in the top right hand corner, they actually came to my farm for a day and they played with my dogs. They swam in the pond. They met um, goats and cats and like all these scary things and learned that that was actually really fun. So my actual procedures. Um, some of this I've mentioned, but there were two training sessions per day, six days per week for eight weeks. Um, they had one field trip per week, one new socialization item every day. And they also went on sleepovers. Um, a sleepover was where every night I would take a new puppy home and I would just integrate it into my family. Um, so while I was eating dinner, it would play with my dogs. If I watched a movie, I would play with it while I watched the movie. Just things to put it into a family environment. Um, this, again, was one way to make sure that I was preparing these dogs for the homes they would go to after the study. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't ripping off the families. Um, I wanted to create well-balanced dogs. 
but also there's been a study um, that was done on guide dog puppies, and it was shown that um, the puppies that weren't um, taken for a sleepover by themselves to a new environment without their siblings, um, they were more likely to fail out of the guide dog program. And that was just because they didn't learn how to adapt to that stress. Um, so I wanted to make sure that these dogs were learning how to adapt to the stress um, of a new environment by themselves. So each puppy went on, I believe, five sleepovers throughout the entire study. Um, and by the end, they knew where they were going. They were happy to be there. They were very comfortable, comfortable there. Um, so it wasn't a stressful experience at all. So those above things, the socialization items, sleepovers, field trips, and training sessions, those were all the same for both groups. No differences there. That's just how I made sure that I was creating well-behaved, well-balanced dogs. Um, what was different were the responses that I gave to each training group when they gave me a specific behavior. Um, so if there was a bad behavior that I wanted to discourage with the positive reinforcement only group, I would redirect it or I would ignore it. So if the puppy's jumping up on me, I would just ignore them and I would wait. If the puppy was chewing on um, like a couch, then I would get a toy and put it in front of their face and encourage them to play with the toy instead. Oh, look, this is you know so much more fun, yay. Um, but on the other hand, if the positive punishment was jumping up on me, then for the first three days, um, I would ignore them, just like I did for the positive reinforcement puppies. But if they didn't learn within those first three days, then I would start to knee them. Um, so I just knee their chest gently at first, and each day it would increase with intensity until the intensity was enough to um, extinguish the behavior. Um, and all of these responses, these were all um, planned out before the study. So I had a, a, an appendix in my proposal, actually, that had every single response I would give at what point in time to each training group. This was just so that it would be consistent. Um, you can't train based on your gut and your you know, innate experiences. Um, so I had all this protocol for it. And um, then I followed through with that, but the majority of the corrections were related to the dog's manners. Um, most of them didn't have to do with obedience commands, so I didn't teach sit by punishing the dog for not sitting. I taught sit the same way I taught sit for um, the positive reinforcement group, by using treats. Um, so the majority of them just had to do with manners, though some did have to do with commands, which I'll talk about actually later. So the types of data that collected. Um, so this was a pilot study. I didn't know what I was looking for, so I wanted to collect as much data as I possibly could to see if there were any differences in areas that I hadn't expected. Um, so how I did this was I um, had daily data sheets. So after every single training session, I would record what happened. I had weekly obedience videos, evaluations by third-party trainers, and then some additional videos as I saw things creep up. Um, a little bit more about that. So this is an example of the daily data sheet. Um, it just has the command that the dog learned. Um, or was working on the duration. So if it was a sit stay, was I asking the dog to sit stay for one second or for 30 seconds? That can really change whether the dog succeeds or fails. Um, distractions, I tried to keep the distractions um, to a minimum, but it's life. Sometimes the other dogs would be barking louder outside the room, um, and I can't control that. So I just wanted to note if there was anything that could have affected the results of that training session. Um, as well as the main thing I was looking at was the number of successes out of the total number of trials. Um, so essentially percentages. And you can see, usually I did this um, in that, it was in this 25 minute block of training block. Um, and so I would do this after, immediately after the training session. I would interact with the puppy while I was filling out this form. Um, this was just to give the puppies more one-on-one -on -one interaction, um, make sure that they were prepared for family environments and I wasn't withholding too much attention from them. Weekly obedience videos. So this is what I primarily looked at. This is all that I've analyzed so far. Um, I, plan I will be analyzing everything else, but this was the majority of my data. And every Friday, how I did this was every Friday, the um, puppies performed essentially an obedience test. So the night before, I looked at what the most advanced dog knew, um, and then all the puppies the following morning were tested on those commands. So if the advanced dog knew downstay, but um, none of the other dogs knew downstay, then all the dogs were still tested on this because I needed to show that none of the other dogs knew it, even though that one did. Um, and then I went back and I coded these videos. Um, I coded them based on either their success or failures or the time that it took for the dog to perform the command. Um, the reasoning for both of these types was because um, some of the commands, such as sit-stay, that's not... Um, whether the dog performs it, that's what's important, whether the dog performs it, not how fast the dog performs it, because I'm determining the length of time. So for a sit-stay, I'm telling the dog to stay until I release it. So the amount of time is completely determined by me, um, whereas for actually the command sit, that's determined by how fast does the dog know it. 
Um, essentially, if the dog performs it faster, then the dog knows the command better, is pretty much what we usually say. Um, and then for the timing, I, these commands were done pretty quickly, so I really quickly realized that um, just regular um, like media players only use one second um, precision, and so I had to actually count the number of frames divided by the frames per second because the dogs were usually doing these commands in under half a second. Um, and I just needed really precise timing. And um, one thing to note is that more commands were added as the dogs progressed throughout the study. So you don't teach all the commands on um, day one. You gradually um, include more commands. So not every command has eight weeks worth of data. Some of them only have four weeks worth of data because maybe it was a more advanced command. Um, the reasoning why I did this was just because I'm trying to replicate real world dog training again and um, I don't want to make some, some claim based on um, a, a study that wasn't done accurately or how real dog trainers train. Uh, lastly, I did third-party evaluations. So I had outside trainers who um, were blind to the purpose of the study. They didn't know my personal view of dog training either. Um, and they came in and evaluated the puppies. The um, on-site evaluations that I had them do were they performed um, 10 tests and then ranked the dogs on how they performed on each of these tests. These were completely subjective. Um, it was on a scale of 1 to 10. I had them perform these tests and then they would write um, what they ranked them as and their reasoning for it. I wanted somebody else's subjective opinion because I clearly couldn't give my opinion on each puppy because I knew the dogs too well. Um, so I, needed, I wanted a subjective opinion from an expert. Um, the other thing I asked them to do was to watch the eighth week um, final obedience video for the puppies and um, score every single obedience command out of 10. 10 was an arbitrary number, um, but I wanted some, um, some value that was easy enough for them to use. And um, the reasoning why I did this was because then I could see whether the um, third party evaluators, whether they had a, showed a difference between the dog's temperament that they liked and the dogs that were the most obedient. Um, because a temperament is things like their friendliness, their independence level, um, how sensitive are they to sound, and obedience is how well did they follow my commands. Um, so those are two very different things, and I wanted to see if there was a difference between them. Preliminary results. Um, so how I did this was I used GraphPad Prism. Um, I did two-way ANOVA statistical tests, and I looked for p-values of less than or equal to 0.1. Um, so normally, a statistical significance is less than or equal to 0.05. Um, but because this is a pilot study with such a small number of dogs, I was looking for anything that was suggestive. Anything that said, maybe, possibly, you should look into this more. Um, that actually didn't end up mattering. The results that were kind of most interesting um, ended up having a p-value of less than 0.05 anyways. Um, but that was originally how I had planned to do this. So this is an example of um, my data for SIT. This is a, just a typical obedience command. Um, so the bars are the means um, of the time it took in seconds for the dogs to perform the command. Um, the y-axis is the time in seconds, x-axis is the week. Um, the red is the puppies that received the positive punishment, blue is the puppies that received positive reinforcement alone. As you can see, there's not a whole lot of difference here, um, and the p-value 0.3924 shows nothing. Um, but what's interesting about that is that there's this huge controversy in the dog training world and dog trainers argue all the time that um, one method of training results in dogs that perform a lot faster because maybe they're happier. Or um, they kind of put all these opinions together and make these claims. And um, this shows that maybe not. Um, again, there's a, um, a small sample size, so you can't say anything for sure. But this would be interesting to look into further of, is this the case? And maybe there's actually not that big of a difference. Um, but this is an example of uh, one that did make a big difference. This, so this was the command sit stay, and um, on the y-axis is now success values. So as I was saying before, this was one that I tested for success and fails, and the values, um, a three meant the dog performed correctly the first time, and then um, every puppy got three attempts, so if they didn't perform correctly the first time, then they got two more attempts, and this was just because puppies have short attention spans. Maybe the puppy wasn't paying attention. Maybe he was sniffing something on the floor. There's no telling. Um, so you, I wanted to give them more than one attempt for it. So a three means that um, it, essentially the dog knows what he's doing. He's focused. Um, he did great. And then two is he failed once, but he succeeded the next time. 
Uh, one is he failed twice, but he did succeed, and zero meant that he just didn't succeed at all. You can see um, weeks two and three, and really four, all about the same. Um, not a huge difference there. They're doing pretty well, but then all of a sudden at week five, the blue, which is the positive reinforcement group, they begin to drop off drastically. Um, they just stop really doing it. Um, and their success value is then a little bit over one. So on average, they took um, a little bit less than um, two attempts at this before they succeeded. Um, and then week six, it continues to drop until um, by week eight, the dogs, not a single positive reinforcement puppy actually succeeded. Um, so each puppy got three attempts, and there were four dogs in that group, so that means there were 12 total attempts, and not a single dog succeeded. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, I have some theories on it, but I don't really know. Um, it's not something that I expected at all. Um, and actually, you can see, though, just to note, by week eight, the positive punishment group also decreased a little bit, and that's because over time, the um, command gets more difficult, so the duration increases, and there are a few more distractions added. So I would expect them to decrease a little bit, but I wouldn't expect them to fail completely. Um, so that was really interesting, and that was a very small p-value, um, very clear that something was going on there. And this is just as a comparison, um, which I kind of found interesting. So this is a down stay. It's the same exact thing, except the dog is in a down position, but it was not significant. There was not a huge difference. Um, I just wanted to note that because there's something about sit-stay. Maybe it's the position that the dog is in, that they're more prone to get up and follow. Um, it's not of, as permanent. It's more stationary. I'm not sure, um, but I did want to point that out, that it seems to be sit-stay is a specific command for it. And then this is uh, the graph for the entire recall. So a recall is a more advanced exercise, which is why it was only started at week seven, six. Um, so I only had three weeks worth of data, so you can't say much. Um, but you can see week six, the dogs performed just equally. Um, essentially, kind of two dogs performed correctly, two dogs did not. Um, this success value was a one and a zero. Um, that's because a one was if the dog performed the entire exercise correctly and a zero was the dog just failed at one point. Um, for this specific exercise, just, just to explain what it is, um, there's three parts. One part is the dog sit stays, the other part the dog comes, and then the third part of the dog, um, so the dog starts here and the dog turns around at your side and faces the same direction as you. Um, I gave the dog cues for each of these. It wasn't too difficult of a task, um, but it was interesting that week six they were about the same and then week seven and eight, the positive punishment group only succeeded, and not a single positive reinforcement puppy succeeded. What's the command for turn around in a line? Uh, close. Close? Close, yeah. So like they get close to your side, um, so that you can walk together forward. Yeah. Other things to note. Um, so I saw a lot of increased aggression in the positive reinforcement group. I didn't expect to see this. I'm kicking myself for not collecting data on it. I didn't know that I should collect data on it. Um, but by week three or four, I started to notice that maybe there is a difference. Um, it seemed to be that positive reinforcement puppies were getting in fights more often, but it was hard to tell. Um, so by week six, and it had gotten pretty clear, but I just wanted to make sure. So I actually built a fence in the middle of their play yard, and I separated them for all their playing. Um, so anytime they were out in the yard, they were separated by training groups so that I could see, was this really the case? And that's when I saw that it definitely was. Um, again, I don't have data on it, but I ended up having to um, actually rush one of the positive reinforcement puppies to the vet because it had gotten in a fight so badly. Um, and they were fighting probably, uh, on my just estimate, um, one to two times a day. I would have to break up a fight in that group, whereas the other ones were maybe like once a week. Um, so that was one thing that definitely needs to be studied further. It's actually starting to come up in the dog training world as a debate. Um, I just actually, there was a, well, on one of the Facebook groups the other day, where there was a big debate on, over whether this is the case or not. Um, so people are interested in it, and according to this, um, it looks like this is something that also needs to be studied further. Um, secondly, as I mentioned before, there was very little difference in the majority of the command speeds. Um, that's something to note if there's this huge controversy over this, and people are making all these claims about one group is happier and the other group is sadder or whatever. Um, Maybe that's not the case. Maybe you shouldn't be making claims about this. Um, just something to note. And then lastly is increased scratching. 
Um, so it doesn't really seem like much, but scratching is a stress signal. Um, it's a displacement behavior, so the dog doesn't know what to do. It's a little bit nervous and unsure, so they'll kind of scratch their neck. Um, and my advisor actually, she suggested that I measure this just to make sure that there wasn't like some extreme scratching in one group as opposed to the other. Um, but the majority of people think that positive punishment puppies will, will be um, more nervous or timid because they're scared of what's going to happen if they don't obey correctly, which makes sense. Um, but what I found was actually the opposite of this. The positive reinforcement puppies were the ones who were more nervous, who performed this behavior more often. Um, and I actually have a graph on this, and um, you can see the blue is the positive reinforcement groups, and the time that they performed this um, action was significantly more than the positive punishment groups. Um, I'm not sure, again, why this is. I can't say. One theory is that um, it could be that the dogs are actually just thinking more. Um, so positive reinforcement groups, they have to make more decisions than the positive punishment because they get less guidance. I, um, as a trainer, the trainer doesn't say what not to do. The trainer only says what to do. So they have to think about, you know, this isn't getting a response, so I have to change my behavior somehow. Um, whereas the positive punishment groups gets um, both sides. They get, um, this is what you should do, and this is what you're not allowed to do. So if the puppy's chewing on the couch, then I say no, and we give it something appropriate to do. Whereas... Um, the puppy from the positive reinforcement group that's chewing on the couch, I just try and entice it. I say, oh, this is more interesting, but they don't get a firm, no, you cannot do that. Um, so th that's one theory that people have kind of um, brought up, but it's not a very common belief just in general that the positive reinforcement puppies are more nervous. Um, but this was definitely something interesting. Um, limitations, always limitations. One is um, the sample size. There were four puppies in each group. That is not ideal. But I did choose it because I physically can only handle so many puppies. And I'm glad that I chose this. I could not have done 10. Um, that was definitely my physical limit. <laughs> um, eight puppies is a lot to just manage between taking them out and everything. Um, if I had added another trainer, then that would have been a huge variable because then that trainer would be different. Um, that trainer might do different things. And also, um, logistically, I can't hire a trainer for two months um, full time. So the sample size, I'd love for this to be done on a larger scale with more dogs. Secondly, the order of training. So the schedule that I told you, um, that I showed you, where um, there were the training blocks and everything, so that was the same every single day. And one problem with that is that the dog that was trained last was trained last every single day. And as a human, I get exhausted. Um, and so by the end of the day, I was more tired than I was at the beginning. Um, that's definitely a limitation. I did alternate the training groups, though, so a positive punishment group. Um, puppy and a positive reinforcement puppy. Those were the last two dogs. Um, so I tried to kind of counteract it as much as I could, but ideally I would have um, randomized it and made sure that every dog was in every position the same amount of time. Um, but the difficulty with that is dogs need schedules. I was trying to crate train them and house train them, and they can't be crate trained if they're not eating on the same schedule and going outside on the same schedule. Um, so that was just something that I had to decide. And um, that's why I decided to alternate the training blocks. Thirdly, um, the certain commands are more difficult to measure. So when I was coding those weekly videos, some commands were hard to determine when the dog actually performed. The main one is um, watch me. The criteria for that is the dog makes eye contact. But it's really hard from a video to tell whether they're making eye contact or whether they're looking at my chin or my forehead. Um, so how I coded that was I um, just counted it as when I began to reward the dog. So when I moved my hand to give the dog the treat, that's when the command um, was a success. Um, and I was consistent across all the puppies for all eight weeks doing this. So there was consistency, which I'm hoping kind of balanced it out. Um, but there was no way for me to look and see whether the dog was making direct eye contact or not. And lastly, there are factors that affect the weekly video performance. Um, Puppies are puppies. Uh, when they go on a sleepover, the next day I could tell the puppy was more tired. So if that ended up, um, if a puppy ended up having a sleepover and then the next day was their weekly test, um, then I could see a difference in their behavior. Usually they would just be more lazy or not as cooperative. Um, they would just interact differently. Um, so that was one thing. Not every weekly video was an accurate representation of what the dog knew. Um, sometimes I would be like, you know, you're better than that, um, but I can't retake the videos. So that was just how it is. Um, that's just a limitation. Ideally, a longer study would have counteracted this. Um, if I'd been able to do more weeks, then hopefully it would have balanced out, but eight weeks was all I could do. So what now? Um, so this was a pilot study again. 
um, small sample size, but it did demonstrate that additional research should be done on this. Um, I'd love for a much larger scale study to be done with multiple breeds of dogs, with um, multiple trainers, all um, randomized, and so I'd love for something like that to be done. Um, and I think this research shows that this is something that should be done, especially since with a small sample size, I was still able to find some significance among different behaviors. Um, secondly, well, mostly just for me, what I'll be doing in the future, I'll be doing a lot more statistical analyses. I've only analyzed those weekly videos, um, so I'll be analyzing more of the weekly videos, but then also all the daily data sheets to see if one group progressed faster than the other um, on a daily basis. Um, I'll be analyzing the evaluator results to see if certain evaluators, whether there was consistency across their rankings of the dogs and um, their performance. And lastly, analysis of all the other videos. So the random ones that I took of like aggression or um, I also took group training videos starting at week six where I trained um, all the positive punishment puppies on one command and all the positive reinforcement puppies on one command um, just to see how they interacted with each other. Um, so I'd like to analyze those just kind of for my interest. Um, so that's what I'll be doing in the future. Thank you so much to University Scholars Program, to Dr. Joseph for giving, and my advisors for giving this opportunity that I definitely could not have done. Um, I learned so much more than I ever could have with just reading about research. Um, it was an excellent opportunity. I'm really, really grateful for it. Um, my research assistant, Ashley Stoops, she did all the weekly videos for me and helped me manage eight little comfort retriever puppies. Um, to Dr. Cindy Otto of the Penn Vet Working Dog Center. She was my advisor for the actual dog training portion, and she helped me make sure that this was as valid of a study as possible um, so that I could use the results as much as I can. And lastly, to Kathy Burgess, breeder of Comfort Retrievers. Um, she let me use eight of her puppies for eight weeks and her facility and gave me everything I could have wanted. Um, very, very supportive. So thank you so much for listening. If you're interested, this is all the puppies in their new homes <laughs> and where they're located. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Could you go back to the uh, yeah. group picture? Stay. Uh, which group picture? Uh, there. That one. How did you manage to get through the stay quiet? <laughs> it took a lot of time, but I was very proud of it once I did get it. I'm amazed. <laughs> it's like it's almost a violation of laws of physics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a lot of attempts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I'm very curious about aggression. Uh, mm -hmm. And the degree to which uh, the dog that I have uh, has a, an aversion to some specific animal, mm -hmm. and is, she's on the whole very uh, comfortable with other animals. Yeah. She's spent time with various ones, but there's some that she has a tick about, and then sometimes too when she's on the leash and feels like mm -hmm. it's more vulnerable, yeah. she can sometimes be more aggressive when she encounters mm -hmm. other strangers than the dog. How would you handle a situation? <laughs> Dog training advice. Okay. Um, usually, so I take it kind of step by step. I start with, me personally, I start with positive reinforcement only first. Um, so I get really high value treats, so like hot dogs. And every time she sees that dog, then I let her look at the dog and then I say, watch me. And then I give her a treat for watching me. And um, with most dogs that works, they learn to look at the thing that they don't like and then look back at you because you're going to give them really tasty treats. Um, so that's usually the first thing. Then if that doesn't work, then I'll maybe introduce some positive punishment. But that's hard because with some dogs that works, but other dogs it seems to trigger them even more because they're kind of in this state of aggression and then there's a physical um, punishment that they're like, oh wait, now it just amps them up even more. Um, so it kind of depends on your dog, but I definitely would start with the um, watch me and the hot dogs. <laughs> We're working on the watch. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Yes. There was one dog, uh, Brett, he's on the far right. He was just like a really good dog. He was just really easy. Um, and uh, he was a positive punishment dog. But I didn't have to punish him very much, honestly, because I never used punishment if it wasn't necessary. If the dog didn't need it, I didn't, you know, and introduce it. Verbal? No. Uh, most of them were verbal. Um, then, yeah, the majority of them were verbals, um, and then some, depending on the command. Um, so, like, for a sit-stay, that punishment was, um, instead of just redirecting the dog and putting them back in place, I would take their collar and take them back gently with their collar and put them back in a sit 
Um, and it just introduces a kind of a physical aspect of this isn't nearly as much fun as when you get the treat out and lure me back into position. Um, so like I, he did have punishment for like that sort of thing. But as far as like barking and biting, um, he was just really good. He was just really easy. I, I should have kept him. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now that your experience with this was mm -hmm. a pilot project, okay. um, and what if you wanted to have kind of good statistical analysis? Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of how many dogs you would have to train, or a group would have to train? I mean, more is always better. Um, the difficulty is that it needs to be a number where um, there's enough of them to counteract the fact that there would be multiple trainers. Um, unless I did a longitudinal type study or unless like I just kept doing this summer after summer to just add to it, um, which I won't be doing. Eight puppies is way too many to train. <laughs> um, I'm done. Um, but So I don't have an exact number, but pretty much I would use as many as I possibly could um, just because each puppy is different. They all have different temperaments. One thing that I did learn is that um, in my personal opinion from this, you there's not a one size fits all um you know like the um, the really good puppy brett he would have been probably i mean fine with positive reinforcement only because i didn't use very much positive punishment with him because he was just good um whereas some of the positive reinforcement puppies um, like the other male nick he's the big one in the middle he could have used some positive punishment he was biting until the very last day he was jumping up and just biting for fun um so there's lots, there's pretty big differences between dogs, which is why ideally you would have as many as possible. And it would also depend on if you use different breeds. So if you wanted to generalize this to um, across the breeds, rather than just one specific breed and one, I mean, almost the same genes um, with the same sire. Um, so if you want to generalize it even larger, then you would need a lot more. Yes? How much do you think of, like, your final results can be, like, like, as a result of the training? Yeah. What? What's sorry? So, like, what's a good dog? And so, like, like how do you think? Like, what percentage to say like your final results mm -hmm. can be explained by like your training versus like the natural personality of the dog like responding to that training? Like, oh yeah. 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 Um, well, the really the most extreme ones were pretty obvious, but then there was also um, like a statistical test you can do um, with the two-way ANOVA that I looked at. I haven't looked at for all of them, but it tests the differences essentially between the subjects to see was there one dog or you know a few dogs that were just outliers. And um, so, like I did that for the command kennel, um, and that showed that there was one dog, the Nick dog. He just didn't want to do that command ever, so he never did. Um, so like he was the outlier. He had skewed the results there. Um, and so I think the most extreme ones that I showed you, those are the ones like where the dogs, none of them succeeded. That's pretty clear that that definitely can be generalized. That can be said that there was a difference there because not a single one of those four dogs succeeded. Yes? Can you think of one small bit of training that would be pretty independent of a trainer that you could outsource to let's say 100,000 families, just basically one behavior. So, so you could basically ask for some crowdsourcing mm -hmm. to um, kind of train your puppy if that puppy was in a certain window of development yeah. over the course of eight weeks, and then basically submit a video if you want to be in order to do so. So we don't have to clone you to, to do this. <laughs> yeah. Um, so essentially to see the differences, to like, yeah. So an example of positive punishment, yeah. Um, I definitely think there could be to some extent some of that uh, because as kind of my results showed, there wasn't really a difference between the time it took for the commands, um, which is really interesting, which means that in future studies, maybe that doesn't really need to be a priority. Maybe they don't need to learn all those commands. Um, maybe they just need to be taught um, you know, some positive punishment for manners. Maybe they need to just be exposed to that. So from that point of view, yes, you probably could for like, uh, maybe, I don't think you can necessarily do it for just one command um, because puppies won't generalize it to their whole kind of their whole life. But if you did it for maybe multiple um, behaviors, such as like biting and barking and jumping up, maybe if you did like those three, which are the most common behaviors, um, if you introduce positive punishment for that, um, that actually that could be a, re a way to kind of get around needing so many actual trainers. 
else. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.